Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pietro, and uh, here with my colleague Joao, we're going to talk about AI explainability and how to bring life and motion, as we call it, uh, into the field, uh, specifically related to the no, clinical setting. So we um, stem all this project from um, another project we're working on related to estimating the likelihood of progressing to chronic kidney disease for patients. So. Um, just a bit of background. First of all, uh, we come from a company called Optum. Uh, we are part of United Health Group, and we are a multinational company that works in the domain of clinical services, health services, and health insurance. And um, the project we, um, we're going to talk about is, as I mentioned, a project to estimate the likelihood of patients that have a chronic condition in the specific chronic kidney disease. And we were trying to estimate which of these patients had a like, high likelihood of progressing from a stage that's more manageable to a stage that's more severe, so that we can take actions in order to prevent that. Well, we, so that the clinicians can take actions in order to prevent that. Um, as you can imagine, being in a clinical domain, there's a lot of um, extra requirements that we need to address. So just providing a prediction is not enough. We need to provide reasons behind it, evidence, and we need to be able to, um, to show that our predictions are deeply rooted in facts. What we're aiming to achieve with this, um, what we were aiming to achieve with this project was providing the clinicians with a, a likelihood for progression, of course, that's the, main, uh, that's the main objective, but also what drives each prediction, so which features um, are contributing to a, a high or low risk score, and in, uh, in what quantity. So which features are more important and how? Are they driving towards a higher risk or are they driving towards a lower risk? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. In order to be fully compliant with the regulations, we also need to be able to address um, what, the, what the algorithm is learning, how it's learning it, and we need to be able to surface that with visualization tools that the clinicians can use. And also, uh, we wanted to address a very important um, issue when it comes to this sort of algorithm, which is trustability. How much can you trust the algorithm you can use? And we have some examples here of issues that we were facing. And I kind of wanted to go with some sort of a pop quiz, but it's not very helpful because the answers are already on the slide. So <laughs> essentially, Suppose that you have a model that has a very high score, whatever metric you want to use. I, we're using um, the area under the receiver operator characteristic as, a, as an example because it makes it easy to compare across models. Suppose that you have a high score for that, like 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Is that enough? Not really. Like, it doesn't tell you everything you need to know. It just tells you that the model may be faring better than comparable models. Uh, suppose that you introduce an additional layer, like for example, we use a library called SHAP. I don't know if, are you familiar with SHAP? Anybody? Okay, I see lots of heads nodding, good. And SHAP can give us an insight as to why a model is making a specific decision across population or across a specific inference. And we can see, for example, for a patient that has a higher risk of progressing than features related to medications or past encounters are very important. And we can see that, we can show that to the clinician, but is that enough? Not really, we still don't trust the model. Like we don't know what the model has learned, how it has learned it, and whether the features that the model is latching on are relevant and important. It might also be the case that the features that the model finds are new things that we didn't know were relevant and instead they are, but it's not always the case. And we can also use AUC, for example, and SHAP values, and other features to compare across different models. And that way we can choose the best model. Uh, can you go back one slide, sorry? We can choose the best model uh, for, for the task at hand. But again, is that enough? Not really, we still don't trust the model. We can see that it's better than others in some ways, which are also fairly difficult to quantify and explain. So what we wanted to achieve was a technique that enabled us to pick the right model out of a bunch of different algorithms. And by right, I don't just mean better perform, because, because in some cases we actually choose to go for a model that is performing slightly worse, but for which we can get a lot more insights and we can understand its decisions better. We can see how the model has learned and how the model has found important features in the data set. Um, 
we want to be able to explain the model inferences. We want to be able to figure out what the model has learned from the features and how it's using the features to generate um, predictions. And also, we want to be able to deeply understand how the model evolves over training, not just when the model has been trained and it's grand, it's fine, it's working, but like, how did the model go through training? How did it learn? And what did it learn? And we have a few examples of that. Joao later on will go through a, a deeper dive into the, you know, we have a small demo uh, of what we've achieved. But these are some, a couple of examples of uh, what we achieved. Like in this case, we're comparing across two models. And what you're seeing is the feature importance generated by SHAP over the whole population as it evolves over training. So we're essentially training a model, stopping the training after a little bit, checking what the model has learned, resuming training, and so on and so on. And you can see these are two different models compared. And you can see, for example, that the model on the right tends to have a much more stable learning paradigm in the sense that the features that the model recognizes as important are more stable. The model finds the most important features, latches onto them, and they don't change very much across training. You see, they swap place a few times, but the top 10 features tend to be roughly the same. The model on the left, on the other hand, changes its mind very often, very quickly. You can see features appearing, disappearing, uh, going up and down by a lot of places. And that's an indication that the model learning paradigm is not stable for that specific data set. And again, this is just an indication. It's not an automatic yes or an automatic no for a model. But it's one of the factors, factors that we considered. Another thing that we did was try to represent the model training over time and over the data set. So what we did was we took the values for the SHAP activations that you've seen um, in the previous slide, because we calculate that for each inference for each model at different time steps over training. We have checkpoints, for example, at 5, 10, 15 percent of training and so on. And for each of those steps, we take those activations, we trained an LSTM to use those activations to recognize, to classify the model, so that we can say, okay, these activations from SHAP were obtained by uh, logistic regression, right? Then we took the hidden layer of the, that LSTM, we trained an autoencoder on that, so that we can have a low-level representation of, uh, well, a low-dimensional representation of those activations. And we mapped those activations across what I like to call the conformational space of training, which if there's any biologists here, I'm sorry, uh, but it's what I call it. And uh, we can plot on a two-dimensional two plane what the model training looks like in that space. We can distinguish particular orbits for each model, and we can identify models that train on similar features, models that have a similar learning paradigm, and models that go in a completely different direction. And Again, going to, into different, completely, completely different directions is not necessarily an indication that one model is better than the other. It's just an indication on what type of features the model is focusing on. And in our case, for example, we had models that focused a lot on medications prescribed to the patients, models that focused a lot on previous encounters and the diagnosis that came out of it, models that focused a lot more on uh, procedures. Because uh, like, these are all very important domains, but each model tended, tended to focus more on one area rather than others. And we can explore these models, because as Joao will go through a demo in a bit, and uh, we, you will see that same chart, which right now in a static slide looks very daunting and complex. And we have um, dynamic views of that. We can explore each of those checkpoints and see what the model generated and how um, what the results look like. We have a couple of references here because uh, the initial idea came from a blog post that Joao found and we discussed and expanded upon. And then we started using this type of techniques to explore our models. The main idea is to take what is a black box model, tear down the walls of the box, and change them into glass so that we can peek into the model, figure out what's going on, squeeze out all the possible information out of it on how the model is making its decisions. And I think at this point, I will leave it to Joao and our demo. Thank you. 
So we saw before with the bar chart animations how we can track the evolution of the feature importance ranking and understand how frequently the model is changing his mind while learning more and more about the data. So if we extend this exercise to all dimensions of visualization we can have with the shape values, we can see something like this. So here we have different animations showing how the explainability of a uh, Nexi boost classifier, which is a popular machine learning algorithm, trained to predict uh, severe um, kidney disease, changes while the algorithm is learning more and more about the data. If we focus at local importance, for instance, that means focusing on a single individual patient, we can see how both the strength and the direction of the most important risk drivers, according to the action boost for this particular patient, change during this constant uh, reshuffling with more data. Again, what each frame of this animation represents is a repetitive process of, say, take 5% of the data, train an action boost, get the shaft values, make a frame, now get 10% of the data, uh, action boost, shaft, frame, 20%, 30%, and so on. You put them all together, you can see this evolution of how the model is, is learning while he's getting more data. That's why in the beginning, it's a bit more inconsistent, but especially towards uh, the end when it has more maturity, it settles pretty much at least for the top two or three most important features. At population level as well, in the second animation, we can see the same exercise, but for everyone, so all of those individual shape values, focus on one particular feature trained in the model, which is the lab measurement code 2160, which is the creatinine level of the patient. So we can also see how is the learning process of the algorithm towards the point of having very low information about the data while he's getting more and more information. We can also see how it interacts with another feature trained in the model, which is not in the y-axis here, but is the age of the patient. So red dots are older patients, blue dots are younger patients. So we can see that after a threshold of about 1.7 in the normalized um, level of creatinine, there is some interaction playing out according to the action boost. Other dimensions are well, as well are cluster analysis, so how different um, patients cluster into buckets based on their risk driver similarity. And the uh, bee swarm plot, so how the distribution of the, those top down most important features change through time. And again, the bar chart animation. So how the, regardless of the risk direction, how the population-wise most important features uh, change and get reshuffled uh, in this continuous uh, retraining process. So that's good. We can understand for the action boost those dimensions of stability uh, of the model explanation. But the real value of this kind of exercise comes when you start to cross compare this with different algorithms. So we can add here another machine learning algorithm. We can, all, we can add the Gaussian naive base. And now we have a side-by-side -side comparison of those animations showing how those two different algorithms uh, interpret the data in different ways. So one of the first things that we can spot is that at local importance, so for the very same patient, they actually give different answers about what are the most important features. Um, the action boost tended to consider one particular lab measurement, which is not directly in the Y label, and the gender of the patient is the most important, while the Gaussian naive base considers some procedure code and the number of doctor visits and so on. And it's also a bit more unstable. You see that, you know, who is the most important and whether it increases or decreases the risk changes a bit more. So the shape values, you can understand that feature importance, but again, it's a way to understand the brain of the machine, how different uh, decision-making strategies with different algorithms reach different conclusions. Here, for instance, we can see that both of them, they agree that overall, the higher the creatinine, the higher the risk for the patient, but they have different strategies. The action boost settles down pretty much right from the beginning, the non-linearity pattern of this relationship, while the Gaussian naive base is a bit more inconsistent. Sometimes it's a bit of a linear pattern, other times it has a negative slope in the end, or or it changes the, the polynomial uh, ordering of things. Uh, and when we jump to the bar chart animation, 
what we can see is that overall they agree not very badly on the top importance features, but one particular interesting uh, disagreement is on this procedure code here, 83970, which you see that, especially towards the end, it considers as the most important feature, but the ActionBoost doesn't even consider that at all among relevant features. So that's a good use case for the humans in the loop concept in AI, because we could bring now here a specialist, a doctor, and ask, is it the case that from a clinical knowledge, let's say, point of view, this procedure code should be the most important piece of information to consider the risk of uh, kidney disease. If it is, it would be one extra point for the Gaussian naive base because this is a pattern that the Actibus couldn't capture. Let's try yet another comparison. Yet here, add a boost. Again, we can see different strategies. The add a boost creates those sort of uh, stairway paths which are not even with the consistent monotonicity, so it's not even always necessarily increasing nor decreasing, and it's like a stable for um, marginal small changes. And in the bar chart, we can see that it agrees again pretty much with everyone else with the action boost, but it doesn't pick here that procedure code 83970, so now it's maybe one point less of traceability from the signal because other independent algorithms didn't agree with that. Right, so that's good. We can do those comparisons across algorithms, but we have here more than 10 different machine learning algorithms. It wouldn't be very efficient to pairwise compare them, uh, each one of them. So the technology we can use is the one described before. We can use embedded representations to try to get all of those same visual insights, but on a single uh, plot. So, just repeating what we are doing here, we are doing a process of take those sharp values uh, that we have for each patient at different moments of uh, data maturity. We train an LSTM to guess uh, which model was used to train the, um, this patient. And then we use autoencoders to reduce the 100 or so activations of each layer of the LSTM to a two-dimensional representation that we can see uh, in this plot. So some interesting things that we can see here is that, let's say, linear support vector machine, linear discriminant analysis, linear regression, they are all more or less in the same region, which makes sense. They are the more linear-ish uh, types of algorithms. So again, if we were talking about NLP, natural language processing, like ChatGPT and so on, a common kind of exercise is, you know, get embedded representations and show that the words cat, dog, and hamster are in one region of the space and the words, I don't know, rain, snow, and wind are, are clustered together. So that's the same kind of exercise, but to understand the brain of machines, so how different algorithms think uh, different or similar to each other. And opposite from the linear models, we have the decision tree and Bernoulli naive base, which also makes sense. They are the more decision tree blocky style of algorithms. The interesting thing as well, because just for the similarity on itself, you could try other mechanisms. You could use PCA or UMAP or so. But the interesting thing is of getting the path, the learning path similarity is to spot things like this. So from the point of zero information, uh, and here you can see that the decision tree at the Bernoulli nave base, they are following more or less the same pillar. So they are all together and after some point they di diverge into different areas. So that's a way of saying that for low sample sizes, the decision making pattern of those two algorithms are virtually the same. And only after some point they start to have more unique decision making. Which also makes sense theoretically because the Bernoulli nave base is based on a strategy of just doing a single threshold division uh, for each feature, which is what the decision tree for a low amount of sample sizes would do, because it would be, be uh, more limited on, on trees. And the other exercise we can do, again, on the humans in the loop concept, so again with the toy example, let's say that a doctor, a specialist, comes here and says that 
the diastolic blood pressure measure of the patient should be, from a clinical knowledge perspective, the most important piece of information to assess kidney disease risk. If that's the case, we can ask uh, to highlight here, uh, let's reduce, just to render faster, uh, what are the regions of the embedded space that are more associated with high importance of the diastolic blood pressure measure. And we can see that, hopefully it's clear, but that this region here that we saw before, that it's mostly associated with linear style of modern architectures, are more associated with high importance of the blood pressure. So again, if it is the case that uh, the blood pressure measure from a theoretical medical point of view should be the most important factor, then we could give a preference to linear uh, types of model architectures because they tend to pick the signal that uh, they should be the most important feature to consider. If we remember as well uh, when we were seeing the Gaussian nave base, that uh, there was one particular procedure code, the 83970, that the Gaussian nave base was considering as high, highly important. We can also try to ask which other algorithms are also considering that important. And what we see is that, again, it's pretty much just the Gaussian nave base that consider that information important, uh, as well as some cases of the nearest centroid. So, Back. This is maybe one last point of traceability to this signal because a lot of other independent machine learning uh, algorithms, they don't agree to pick uh, this signal as the most important piece of information to consider. So bringing everything together, uh, we can enhance this uh, AI safety aspect of the model development cycle using this kind of analysis. So instead of just considering performance, what is the highest recall or F1 or whatever, we can bring in clinical knowledge and this concept of uh, AI explainability, consistency and stability through time to generate a safer MLOps pipeline in healthcare. And that's it. This is our contact. Thank you. That was a very nice sound. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Thank you both, if you want to come on board. <laughs> uh, so the, there were a few questions about uh, Shapley and Shapley used. Uh, there was one uh, quick uh, uh, question, sorry, I just have to switch to Slido up, perfect. Uh, on, um, on the model, um, hyperparameters, Upper parameters, and um, I don't know if you want to switch to the slide, but I can ask you straight away. Uh, should the model upper parameters uh, can be changed as it train uh, on 5%, 10%, etc. of the data? Uh, I would not fit the same model with 5% versus 100% uh, of the data. Mm -hmm. and yeah, for, for this particular exercise, the, the main intention was just to track net of any kind of parameter change or, or anything how the, for the same parameters, how the, each of those algorithms for the same data, how they change their minds during consecutive retraining. So in this exercise, all of them, they had uh, their own default uh, parameters. They were kept like that. They were all being used uh, with um, a normalized version of the data so that yeah, sure. some algorithms couldn't get uh, an advantage of uh, being better at unnormalized data and so on. So the focus was just to get everyone having the same kind of source data, how their evolution of uh, learning changed. And if I may add uh, one thing on top of that, like the idea is quite interesting, but you would lose the ability to compare directly what a model looks like across training, over training. So if you train a model on say 10% of the data with a set of parameters, hyperparameters, and then you train a different model with a different set of hyperparameters on 20% of the data, you can't really compare them directly. Uh, the idea is quite interesting. We might explore it on how to do that, or even how to define a direct comparison between these different type of models, but they are different models. So direct comparison is kind of out of the question if we want to maintain the sense of what we're doing. 
Yes, go ahead. Sorry, the reason for the question was, would you trust feature importance on an XG boost that might completely overfit the data? <clears throat> that, that's the question, basically. Like, if I'm training it on 5% of the data, I mean, it might completely overfit it. Would I trust the feature importance on that? That's, yeah. that's the in, in that particular exercise, they are all like, uh, even though we are talking about, say, taking 5% of the overall data and so on, they are all had their, their SHAP values evaluated on a test data. So at, at an unseen data, always with the same uh, dimension that the model has never seen before. So a question perhaps connected to that. Uh, since SHAP values monitoring change considerably during training, uh, what is the logic by which you can say uh, that one variable is more significant than the others? Well, there are many ways we can do that, but uh, in the essence what we're trying to do, we're not necessarily or automatically try to assess that. Uh, the idea behind what we're doing here is not necessarily to figure out which features are more important for each model at each stage inherently. It's more about trying to figure out how the model is learning and digging through the features and latching onto the most important ones. If we wanted to do something like that, we'd at least need uh, deeper support in terms of uh, subject matter experts. We do work with clinicians to understand all these features much better. Like, and even working with clinicians, like I, I can't just go to someone and for a doctor and say, so is diagnosis code 8913-2 important? They're just looking at me going like, what the hell is that? Like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's not inherently part of this current exercise, but it's definitely something we could and would explore over time. Yeah. And part of this exercise also is trying to aim exactly at that because that's exactly the point. If we can see that there are some algorithms that they are always, you know, consistent about this is the most important features and it doesn't matter if you keep reshuffling things, they keep giving the same answer versus another algorithm that every time you reshuffle gives a completely different answer. That's the pattern that we want to avoid on those kind of algorithms. And this is also a point of that the embedded representation can help because we can see that some of them, say the action boost, they have this sort of, you know, smooth linear pattern, which is a proxy of that stability, while others like the, the uh, those ones that are all over the pace, like the passive aggressive classifier, they are everywhere in the embedded space. So sometimes it thinks that uh, it's more like a linear model, other times it's another architecture. So that chaotic pattern that we can also see visually, it's also a proxy of how unstable the model is in terms of giving for sure these are the, the important features. Thank you. Um, uh, yes. uh, I think probably you, you mentioned a little bit in that, uh, but as a setup of uh, the whole process, you first do some correlation between uh, different features in order to have perhaps some insights and then set up the uh, explainability process. So there is some prior work that we do in order to understand relationships between features, uh, but that's not captured in this current demonstration in the sense that uh, for most of the features we have, we're actually dealing with a very sparse space of categorical features. Uh, there's only very few, well not very few, a few thousands of features, which are still very few in the grand scheme of things, uh, that are numerical and non-sparse. It's mostly related to lab results. And, well, they're still sp pretty sparse, but anyway. Uh, when it comes to analyzing categorical relationships, we do some work with that, but we tend not to incorporate it immediately in this unless we're using specific algorithms that need to know that. For example, for linear models, having highly collinear variable is a problem. For tree models, not really. So uh, it's something we take into account, but it's not captured directly into the current demo. Thank you. So for the last question, if, if you have other questions, please uh, then come forward. Uh, but it's very interesting, perhaps. How does the SHAP compute the importance of a single features with respect of, to the others? And also, ah, yeah, yeah, it's going to be long. Uh, is there a general formulation for all machine learning models? This is quite broad. And uh, yeah, the last part, if there is there a general formulation for all machine learning models? Perhaps we mentioned a little bit before. With so the answer to the last part of the question is yes, the formulation is fairly generic and it's based on uh, Shapley values 
as the name of the library suggests. But essentially what these values represent is um, how the features um, interact with each other in a, in a uh, oh, the word is escaping me, in a model that's, um, so essentially the way they're calculated is an analyzing the interaction of each possible subset of features with each other. So each pairwise, uh, each pair of features, each triplets of features. So it's, it tends to be a very expensive type of calculation because it, it grows up fact, uh, with the factorial of the, of the features, of course. But the formulation takes into account for just the interaction between these features, among these features, not necessarily with what these features look like and how they're constructed. So it is a very expensive um, computation, but it's very generic. And it doesn't really matter what type of model you're using on top of that. It only matters as to uh, how those features contribute to your targets. Yeah. And this is also in their own words, <laughs> if anyone wants to explore. But yeah, and stressing again, the most important thing that many other feature important strategies do not have is the fact that it's uh, agnostic. So it doesn't matter either if you're talking about different algorithms, but either you're talking about, let's say, uh, computer vision, like here, for instance. So you're using exactly the same technology, but applied to computer vision. So here, the AI model could identify that this animal is a Dovicher, and this one is a meerkat. But why it identified that? And using the same technology can highlight uh, because of the long peak and the pattern in the eyes or because of the, yeah, the, the large eyes and so on, it's a meerkat. So it's all agnostic, it's all based on a game theoretic approach of shuffling around simulations uh, of the variables, but you know, in a way that you can have some understanding of causality and not just shuffling things and see what happens. Okay, thank you. If you want to put it out, uh, your own contacts, I'll let you, yep. Pietro, finish with the last sentence. Thank you. Sorry, the expression that I was looking for earlier came back to mind. So Shapley values come from game theory, and it's essentially a competitive model that establishes the feature importance. Thank you. <laughs> Done. Thank you all. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you. Thank you.